It's hard to imagine our lives now without ALS, having ALS in them and having been impacted so profoundly, the most impactful experience of my life. I wish it wasn't so, though. I don't know. It's it's too cute to say I would trade places with Stacy. <laughs> she was a better person than I am. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Prepare for a journey filled with laughter and heartfelt moments as we welcome Jonathan Penner to our podcast. The actor, screenwriter, and survivor icon shares tales that swing from emotional depths to the peaks of fun, offering a glimpse into his life on and off the screen. Our chat with Jonathan is a blend of raw emotion and delightful stories showcasing his versatility and resilience. Tune in for a conversation that reveals the many layers of a truly captivating personality. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Jonathan Penner, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making time for Troy and I to talk with you. Most people will know you from the Survivor series because of the show's popularity and because you stand out with your Paul Newman eyes, your Cheshire cat smile, your fox-like cunning, and of course, the hat. But you're so much more than the character people have seen on Survivor. Your Hollywood career is nothing if not eclectic. And I know our common bond is from the darkest chapter of your life. So thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. I am excited. Uh, humbled to be here with you and um, looking forward to having an, an, a nice conversation. Thank you for those kind words. When did you first aspire to be an actor? I was very young when I aspired to be an actor. I always had a big, loud voice. And even as a little kid, like six or seven, they were like, you should be an actor because I would walk around with this booming voice. And I was a little, little guy, little. And um, so I said, oh, I guess I should be an actor. And I, I had a big personality as as I'm now talking with my hands all over the place. So so since I was six, I'm going to say, I said, that's a thing to be. And being a lazy person. I never like stopped thinking about it. I never said, you know, that's what you thought about when you were six. I just kept thinking and move forward. There is a lag in your bio from 1981 when you graduated high school and in 1989 when you starred in your first film, A Fool and His Money. What were you doing for those eight years? Chasing girls, mostly. <laughs> um, that, that was my... That was my hobby. I mean, I, I I graduated high school. I went to college, which was uh, had been a all girls college until not so very long before Sarah Lawrence College, and um, there were a lot of girls there, and I I I had fun and probably made a fool of myself much of the time, and then and then I continued wanting to be an actor. Um, I went to London and studied acting for a couple of years, and then I came to New York City and pursued a career as an actor and um, got into a film uh, as an actor, as a, a minor part in a movie called White Palace, and befriended Jason Alexander, who had just filmed, it hadn't even been on the air yet, something called The Seinfeld Chronicles. 
And um, he was in this other woman uh, movie with me and a bunch of other people. And he and I became very good friends. And I said, well, I want what you have. I was maybe 27 at this point, something like that. I said, I want what you have, which is a wife and a career. And he said, oh, and he and his wife introduced me to his wife's first cousin, who was Stacy Title. And we fell madly in love, were married, were engaged within a year and married within a year after that. And that set the course of my life. So so for those eight years, I pursued acting and looked for the right woman to have in my life. How did you, uh, when you guys became, just became friends on set together, just running into each other and... Yeah, you know, uh, on a movie on location like that, it was shot in St. Louis. You don't know anybody except the other people in the movie. Um, we were staying in a hotel. So, you know, you'd go to work. You'd sit around work when you're not shooting. You'd, uh, you want to have a sandwich. You want to read the pay here. Here's a piece of the newspaper, you know, and you start to become friendly with the other folks. And then you go back to the hotel. What are you doing for dinner? You want to hang out? Let's you, are you working out tomorrow. I'm not shooting. Oh yeah. Let's go to the gym or let's go to the museum or I don't know. And so he and I actually became quite good friends and still are to this day. Very, very close friends, family members now. That's awesome. And your co-star in that film was Sandra Bullock. Do you stay in touch with her? If not, do you ever run into her and say, hello, remember me? I, I wish I had stayed in touch with her. Now you're talking about A Fool and His Money, uh, which we shot as Religion Inc. Religion Incorporated. It was a crazy, very small movie. My first movie. I'm not good in it. I'll admit it. She was great in it. Um, I mean, I tried, but I was, I, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and, and I think it shows if you dig that movie up, but I had fun and we became friends and then we sort of fell out. She wound up going to LA. I was still a New York actor. I was, a, I was such an ass. Can I swear on the show? Oh yeah. I was an asshole. I was an asshole, young actor. Some people who watch me on Survivor think that I have not changed, but that's that's another story, and we can get into that if you want. But, you know, I was very, I trained in London, and I was very snobby about being an actor, okay? This is a true story. I'm not proud of it, but this is the truth. And she said, well, I'm going to L.A., and and I'm going to, you know, um, uh, audition around. And, and then she got a part. She got a part. She was working all the time. She was successful already, but she got cast in the Working Girl. Do you remember that movie Working Girl with um, uh, Melanie Griffith and Sigourney Weaver and Harrison Ford? It was a really good movie. And they made a TV series out of it. And she got cast as the lead. And I'm like, oh, come on, the TV show, you know. And of course, she became Sandra Bullock. I knew her as Sandy Bullock. She was my friend, Sandy. Um, and she was wonderful. Anyway, she she went on to other things. She did a couple of things. And I don't know, people may have heard of her. And then I wound up, you know, waiting tables mostly. Anyway, that's the story. I wish I'd stayed in touch with Sandy. And I'm sure that she would remember me uh, for better and for worse. But I think for better. And of course, you know, I hope I'm not. I'm, I know I'm not telling tales out of school. Her her boyfriend or her husband recently passed away from ALS himself. So I know that she has been touched by by the disease that unfortunately has brought us together. Um, uh, but I haven't I haven't reached out to her. I probably should. I should. Did you ever think to yourself, this is my ticket, my franchise? What about The Naked Truth, a TV series that was highly successful? The Naked Truth was supposed to be the biggest thing that season. It starred Tay Leone, who was, is a star, superstar. I got to work with some extraordinary, extraordinary actresses. And um, um, that I got that part as the male lead. It really was her show, The Naked Truth. But her character's name was Nora. My character's name was Nick. Nick and Nora were the names of the two characters in the Thin Man series of movies. And um, and we were, you know, coupled romantically on the show. And um, it was it was really the part to get that year for a young actor. I was so excited. I still was excited. And it went to series. We had Tom Hanks 
did our second episode. We shot the pilot episode. They decided to go to series. The first episode back, which was the second episode, Tom Hanks was our guest star. And we thought that we were absolutely going to go through the roof. And for whatever reason, the show, though it was successful and it ran for a couple of seasons, never quite had the the thing that turned that would turn something into friends or turn it into a show that anybody watching might might really have heard of. It was successful. I really thought that I had it made. And, you know, I made I mean, it's it's more than I ever dreamt of to be the male lead on a, on a successful network TV show. Um, but for whatever reason, it didn't quite work out. Tay has done just fine for herself. She seems to be doing OK. <laughs> Everyone, everyone you're around seems to be doing really well, right? Yeah, me too. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been a good, everyone's had a pretty good, uh, it's funny that your early years, um, a lot of, a lot of stars, you know, a lot of, a lot of big names, right? Big, big names, wonderful, wonderful performers. And, you know, if, if folks are interested, I'm sure the naked truth is available somewhere. They kept fixing it and fixing it and trying to figure out why it wasn't working. They put us on a different network. They recast it. I only lasted the first two seasons and they brought on another guy who was essentially me, but a different version of me. They thought, I don't know, you know, and that's okay. They were trying to make it work and it, and it never quite worked. Worked. She, of course, has gone on to um, to a lot of movies, and and Madam Secretary was a big, big, big hit show for her. So but it was great. It was really fun. How about your Academy Award nomination, where you wrote, produced, and starred in the short film Down on the Waterfront? That is quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Yeah, my my Stacy and I made that film together. I also starred in it with Jason Alexander. Um, it was extraordinary. You know, that was extraordinary for a young couple. It's based on a simple, true story. And she and I wrote it. And uh, her father, who was a commercial producer, helped us get it produced. And um, we we went to the Academy Awards with it. I mean, it was crazy. You know, I mean, it literally was crazy. Um we didn't win, but we won. I mean, I've been to the Academy Awards. I'm an Academy Award nominee for the rest of my life. I'm in the Academy. No one can ever take that away from me. And and it really did launch our career. You know, it really did. So so making that film was wonderful. We worked with um, um, Ed Asner, who was Lou Grant on the Mary Tyler Moore show, and every, everyone's seen him. He was a big, rough, tough kind of guy. And, uh, and me and Jason and Ed did it together with another friend of ours. And um, Mike Starr was in it, who people might recognize. And um, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> I, I, I went to the Academy Awards and sat there waiting for them to read my name, you know. And then they read some other idiot's name. And like, not, not, not a bigger idiot than me, just some other guy who'd made a movie. And I'm watching him go down the aisle. And Stacy and I are kind of looking at each other like, oh, well. And then I realized I was literally drenched i'm in this monkey suit you know i'm in a wool tuxedo that i that i was wearing and and i was sopping wet i had sweat all the way through the tuxedo it was it was, and then i had to sit there in this wet tuxedo for the rest of the night while you know other stuff was going on realizing oh well on to the next one you know i guess i'm i guess i didn't win the academy award tonight i'm still yeah, waiting to get back to the academy awards yeah, you'll still get there. You still got plenty of time. When you're working on a project, uh, Jonathan, does each one do you think like, oh, this could be the next one that takes me to the Academy Awards? Or does some just feel different when you're working on them? Well, we certainly didn't, maybe Stacy did, but I didn't think about going to the Academy Awards with, with that one. And then it took us to the Academy Awards. You know, the Academy Awards is a pretty specific thing. So like later in our career, when we made The Bye Bye Man, for instance, which is a horror movie, um, I knew I wasn't going to the Academy Awards with that one. Um, there, there have been, there have been a few projects that we've worked on. I've worked on that. Where I said, you know, this might have some life in it beyond, beyond, um, uh, straight to streaming, uh, which is, I mean, getting anything made 
as you guys probably know, is really, really hard. It's an incredible accomplishment. And, and it, you know, can't be taken for granted. I, I, there are movies that you see that you say, how the hell did this get made? And you say, well, because they, you know, they got somebody to get the money or, you know, however it happened, it's very hard to do. Most movies, most scripts never, never get close to, to having some financing put behind them, let alone seeing the light of day, the way that, the way that some of the projects that I've worked on have. So I consider myself very, very lucky, even if I haven't yet been back to the Academy Awards. My One of the things my dad told me when I was growing up for both his, well, all of his careers in football and in writing and all that stuff, he used to say that there's a football player out there that's more talented than me who never made it to the NFL. And when I was younger, I'm like, how could that be? You were a first round draft pick. How could someone be more? And they used to say, there's a writer out there that's more talented than me. It's never been published. Oh, you've got all these books. How could they? And then when I got older, you know, you kind of get to see life, uh, life's funny like that. Yeah, that's so wise. And what a great thing for a dad to to teach his his son, you know, that that it's uh, there's a lot of luck, a lot of hard work. You know, there may be somebody more talented, but there's not going to be somebody working harder um, or who wants it more or even if as hard as you work and you want it as much as you do. Shit happens too, you know. Yeah. Shit happens, as we all know. So you got to take it with a grain of salt and just press forward as as best you can. You have to enjoy the process, right? You have to love what you're doing, whether you get to the Academy Awards or become a best selling author or not. Tell us about the Survivor experience. How did you invent the character, or is it just you? It's just me. I. It's. Just, it's just me. Here's the thing about Survivor, which is interesting. Thank you for it. You're so cute. And I have to say before I go on, it is uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you and to and to allow me to have some time into space uh, with you. Um, about Survivor, you know, they the, the casting director on Survivor is was maybe still is it's a different person now pretty brilliant not that casting me was a brilliant move but they were brilliant at finding people who would not simply collapse under the strain and the stress and who would still push on as hard as they could they really look for folks with a pretty positive attitude and as well as you know, there's they need a mix of looks and of ethnicities and of and of backgrounds and even of ages. But um I learned so much about myself playing Survivor. It was very, very humbling, honestly. Uh, especially watching myself on Survivor, because it really was just me, you know, just me under duress, just me right. eating bugs or eating sea slugs sleeping in the dirt sleeping with people that you that the three of us would run away from talking <laughs> to on a day-to-day -day basis but are forced to to sit with not bad people just people who would drive you insane we all have cultivated our lives very very deliberately to get most of the jerks out of our lives right yeah maybe in a in a in a parking lot somewhere, you got to deal with a jerk or online at the bank or wherever. But for the most part, if you're a jerk, you're out of my life. And that was not necessarily the case. And I know that I was the jerk for many of those people. They were they hated me because I whatever I, I looked this way, I talked that way, whatever it was. So so th they were able to put a mix together of 20 people. I think I played with 20 people. And then 18 people um, who would make for good TV. And the harder it got, the better the TV would get. The harder people sure. would compete, the more aggressive they would become or the more they would more humble they would become. All of those things. So so it, it, it's just me, Tim. It's just me mm -hmm. out there fighting the good fight and and making a bit of an ass of myself some of the time and making myself proud some of the time too. Yeah, you know, it was quite extraordinary actually. Do you think that when you were on the show, because because I was watching I told you I was watching those uh the clips of you on there. And uh 
a lot of times, you know, people felt like you were kind of always scheming and up to something. Looking back on it, when you watch it and think about it, were you actually always trying to stay like a step ahead? Or do you think you were just oh, being you and people read too much into it? Or Well, both. I mean, I was yeah. always thinking. Sure. But I wasn't scheming. I mean, I'm a terrible game player. I'm a terrible liar. So, but they always assumed, because I was thinking, I was trying, and I was trying to play the game. I mean, hell, I'm on Survivor. Let's play Survivor, man. Let's mix it up. Let's have some fun. Let's, you know, they assumed, and I'm not stupid, and obviously I can talk and talk and, you know, I'm an animated person. They always assumed there must be more going on than meets the eye. There must be, yeah. he must be thinking something. I literally had somebody say it was those blue eyes of yours. I, you know, they were scary. I thought you were, you were always trying to get me. I'm like trying to get you. That's <laughs> just trying to, just trying to stay alive out there, you know? So, so uh, I, I really wasn't scheming and went out of my way to try not to lie. I knew that I'd have to do some gameplay you know backstabbing oh, yes. but i'm a, as i say i'm a terrible liar and i'm lazy to the degree that i don't want i can't remember what lie i told what did i tell you it's always easier just to tell the truth because then you can repeat it your story holds up if you tell the truth right. <laughs> you don't have to remember what lie i told so i really am a pretty pretty straightforward person and i don't think anyone could believe it they didn't they didn't trust it yeah, it's funny watching those, your, the ebbs and flows of your storyline. It's like everybody loves you, the most trusted guy. Then the next two minutes later, everyone's like, oh, we got to get Jonathan out of here. But then, you know, lo and behold, before the vote, you start talking and everyone is back on your side. It was great. That was hilarious. It was really fun to watch. I'm so glad. Yeah. I mean, they, they brought me back and they brought me back. They really thought I had a winning game in me. And I did until I blew it. The third time I played, I should have won. And it really was mine to win. But I, you know, I blew it. It blew right past me, my opportunity. I just plain missed it. And as you know, as a as an athlete, sometimes it's a matter of just not making a mistake and letting the other guy make a mistake, you know. Sure. And uh, I made I made a, a one or two big mistakes, and that's enough to lose the million dollars. It, that's the way it goes. Is there a... Uh... I know probably everyone always asks you about, I, I was reading some of your stuff and a lot of people are saying, what was your favorite season? What was your favorite? So I won't go that, uh, that broad. I'll go more specific. Did you have a favorite, you know, challenge or something like that that you did where you felt like either you had the most fun or you learned the most about yourself? Well, those may be two answers. Sure. Um, there, there was a challenge the last season when I was absolutely on the chopping block it was an individually immune individual immunity challenge, and it was you know win or go home. I had never once in my three seasons won an individual immunity challenge, and somehow the gods were on my side this day, and I pulled it out of my butt basically by the you know by the skin of my teeth, and I and I and I did I won, and I saved myself, and I was so happy proud um it, it was amazing so that that was certainly my favorite uh challenge one where i learned the most about myself well i got injured in a challenge and that that wound up knocking me out of the game the second time i played I learned a lot being injured and being in a hospital in Palau, Micronesia, which if you can avoid, I urge you to, to avoid to avoid that experience. Um, but uh, uh, a challenge where I learned about myself, you learn you learn that you can really dig deep. You can go literally. You know, you can stay under the water for a, an extra couple of seconds. You can. You can run just a couple extra yards further than you think that you that you could. So so that was very, very empowering, actually. Many of those things. I'm not an athlete. You know, Tim, uh, I, I was sort of an athletic kid and I was in shape as an actor. I worked out a lot and, and needed to try to stay as fit as I could. And I enjoy working out. But I had never really challenged myself athletically. I never excelled at the game but I, I i tried not to make a fool of myself 
too often in the challenges. And that was that was great to see. Fun. Yeah, you had some great moments too with uh with Jeff. You know, there's the, the classic, my ass, right? You're just throwing at the targets and you had some really good one-liners going back and forth with him. And it didn't seem like anybody else really ever did that. <laughs> they were terrified of him. <laughs> terrified. I don't know. I'm an old enough guy. I've done enough in my life. He doesn't scare me. I mean, honestly, at this point, very few things do scare me, but he certainly didn't intimidate me. He tries to intimidate you. He tries to browbeat you. He swears like a sailor also. You know, come on, you fucking, you know, and he would try to do that. To, I'm sorry if I'm swearing too much, but now oh, I'm being yeah. kept roped. Oh, I'm Jonathan Penner. I'm so fucking smart. I can fucking, bah, bah, bah. you know, I'm like, you're, you're not going to get me to, to go for the bait, Jeff. I'm trying to win a million dollars here. So cool it. That that never made it on air. But that, that was an interesting tribal council. But other people wow. were scared of him. They were scared of offending the producers. I had some idea of how a TV show was put together, which actually helped me certainly every time I played. I said, oh, now they need a plot twist or now it's time for this to happen or that to happen. And, and because I understand the basics of story structure. So I understood kind of where we were at in the story of a season, things like that. I love the, uh, the evolution, like when you first got there and I think it was the first season you were on. I love that you were, you would go out and catch, this is just like a personal favorite. You're catching like all these fish and you're like, I'm going to get voted off unless I can show them how valuable I am. You're catching fish, you're getting coconuts, you're getting water, you're building the camp. And then at some point I, I might be mixing seasons, but at some point you come back with all these fish and people are like laying down sleeping. And they're like, Oh, we just wanted to rest. And you're like, you're not getting any of this fish today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got very, very upset. You get very hangry. You know, of the course. phrase to get hangry. Yeah. And I was much yeah. younger, though I was old. I was the old guy then. I'm now the ancient guy for by on survivor terms. But I was the old guy on the show at 44 the first time I played, playing with a bunch of 20 year olds who were just, I'm here at the spa. Now they were brilliant. They understood that they were playing with each other and they didn't want to put targets on their back or they didn't want to do a lot of different things that I didn't think about because they they were in many ways much more sophisticated about the game than I was. That's the truth. But I also mm -hmm. did understand like they're going to keep me around long enough if I if I provide for them, if I take care of them a little bit. But then I got very resentful, like, move your ass, man. I know you, Tim, as a father, was like, yeah, no, you can't spend the day on the couch watching TV and I'm going to feed you. Get your ass up and do your chores, you know. And that's how I felt. Like, who the hell are you guys? What do you think? I'm not your slave. It was it was humiliating. There's one thing to be humble. There's another thing to be humiliated. And it's, sometimes it's a fine line, you know. You get humiliated and you get very resentful. You can really snap back. I love that. Uh, that moment was I was I would pause and I was cracking up. I had to pause so I didn't miss the next uh, the next thing because it's you kept going, you kept going. And at some point, you just got sick of it. So it was great. <laughs> exactly. At a certain point, you know, it's humiliating. That's that's the thing. How much how much crow can you eat? I'd eaten enough. Yeah. Of course, that's what blew me up out of the show, basically. Then in 2017, in the ultimate collaboration, you and Stacy wrote and produced and she directed and you acted in The Bye Bye Man, a horror film that was wildly successful. Um, yes, 2017 was a big year. We actually made the film. I think we shot it. It came out in January of 2017 and we shot it at the end of 2015. And we spent much, much of 2016 in what's called post-production as, as, as this show will get a little post-production um, uh, editing and doing the music and finding the right release date. Um, it was one of the great fun things that I ever did. Stacy was brilliant filmmaker. Uh, a brilliant person, extraordinary partner. Um, we wrote that movie together. I got the writing credit. She got the directing credit. We did collaborate on everything, although there's no question she directed that movie. But I, you know, I was there all the time saying, what about, you know, I think we can do better on the close up. What do you think? This close up is kind of crappy. You know? She's like, it is. I'm like, I think. Anyway, she, 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 she let me talk into her ear because um, she was wonderful. 
So we had a great time making that. Both of my kids are in that movie. We put as many of our friends in that movie as we could. And um, in the end, the picture, uh, I urge people, if they're interested in seeing it, I'm close to unrecognizable in my cameo because I shaved my head and had a beard and a mustache like you have, uh, Tim. Um, uh, Watch the unrated director's cut. It's better. Well, we had Faye Dunaway, who's a pain in the ass. Um, we had wonderful people in the movie. It was it was a lot of fun. I mean, making movies is the most fun there is. Uh, well, what one of the most fun things there is? Not the most fun, but it's very fun. And um, and we had fun doing it. And then the film came out in January of two thousand seventeen, and and uh, and Stacy got sick in. The summer of 2017. It was a big year. By the end of that year, she'd gotten her diagnosis. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, it was quite the roller coaster. I got some highs and some lows and just that journey. This is where your story turns dark as the darkest horror film and where our lives intersect, where Stacy battles with ALS and passes in 2021. I feel like Stacy's and my role in this horror film, and it is a horror film, our roles are easier than the loved ones that we leave behind. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. I appreciate that, that I appreciate that sentiment. Um, I'm here your loved ones, and I hope you live a long life. I hope you, I hope you thrive. If you pass away, your loved ones will move on and honor you. I am in pain, of course, from Stacy's passing. My loss of Stacy, the world's loss of Stacy, but I sure wish she was here. And, and uh, she wishes that she was here. Horror films, it is like a horror film. What what my family has gone through, I know some of the darkest times that your family goes through, that you are able to bring so much light to your to your experience for the rest of the world, for yourselves, make this into something positive. Sharing your experience is a blessing for all of us. And I hope it's a, a blessing for you guys as well to be able to to, to do and to share together. I, I, I'm sure in some ways it is. And I'm sure in some ways you wish that you didn't have to do it. It's hard to imagine our lives now without ALS, having ALS in them and having been impacted so profoundly, the most impactful experience of my life. I wish it wasn't so, though. I don't know. It's it's too cute to say I would trade places with Stacy. <laughs> she was a better person than I am. And, and <laughs> she was a better person than I am. That's what I could say. And I wish she was here. thank you horror the reason I like horror movies love horror movies and think that they're important is because horror is important horror is real horror is a real emotion it's a real part of the human existence and in some ways my experience Stacy's experience with horror helped us prepared us allowed us to deal with some of the things that actually came at us we were able to contextualize them we were able to i don't want to say enjoy them but i will say that that we were able to be intimate with each other in ways that people who have not experienced horror are intimate. And in, in, to, in that way, it was, a, it was a gift that I could be with her and, and, and give to her in ways that very, very few people fortunately get to experience and be with each other. 
Does that make sense? I'm, I know it makes sense to you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think for even somebody who hasn't experienced it, I think basically you're, you guys had a connection that, that was so far beyond, um, it's so far beyond the normal, the normal, I guess, human connection, right? Through your relationship, but also through your your bonding through work and through the the horror films, you're able to connect on a deeper level. Which I think I say a very similar thing about uh, our family. A, a, a lot of us did uh, sports, and that's kind of like a thing we can because you get knocked down, you get knocked out, you get hurt, right? Whatever it is, and you just have to keep getting back up. And that's something we use. It's it's a uh, probably an analogy we use because of our background where you guys probably uh, use some more horror films and other things from the business. But yeah, it's, it's, um, no, it's, it's hard to explain to people who don't know, but I feel like hopefully people listening can, I think they'll feel your, understand your, your analogy, but we, I understand it crystal clear. So yeah, I appreciate you two being, being vulnerable about it. I know it's a, as a, a tough subject, but it's real and it, and, and, um, you know, you guys are a great voice for ALS and, and, you know, just for people. Yes. Thank you. I, I, um, I, I, I think that it's important to try to maintain one's vulnerability. You know, it's like when you're in a, when you're in a storm, if you can breathe and just walk, just walk and yeah, you're going to get wet. You're going to get wet anyway but it's a lot easier to let the wind kind of blow through you and not try to try to fight it. Something in horror is, and this is almost a horror phrase, right? When, and one of the things that a lot of horror movies are about, it's a little off subject, but, but re- repression of, of emotion, of trauma, of rage, repressing that, ignoring it, pretending it's not there, it's not affecting me, whatever. It comes out in other ways. And there are famous stories of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or stuff like that, you know. And um, so I try not to repress the emotions that come out. Obviously, I'm still raw. And in some ways, I hope I'm always raw when I think about Stacy and and how I f- feel about her and, and, and what we went through and what she went through. You know, I hope I'm never... Oh yeah, that happened a long time ago, and yeah, that was terrible. You know, it, it's it, it's still very very visceral, and 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 for me, and um, and maybe people can understand that. Uh, I'm sure they can. Of course they can. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. It's not. I don't think it's anything to to be uh, ashamed of or, or embarrassed of at all. I think it's. I think totally agree with you. I think it's it's amazing to have those memories so close. You can tell how close they are to you by just how quickly you're. Even when you talk about Stacy, you have a different look in your whole face. Whether it's happy or sad, you have a different. It's like she's she's still there with you, which is it's beautiful to see. Thank you. She was extraordinary person, extraordinary, and and my person, you know, my person. My Christian faith has been my strength and has given me my grit during this time. I know you are Jewish. Did your religion help you make any sense of this tragedy? It's a great question. I'm I'm not truly a religious person. I'm I was raised as a Jewish person more culturally. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. If I went to services they were jewish services at a temple or a synagogue but and 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 excuse me i'm sorry i'm like blowing my nose um um, what i want to think of how to put this so that it's uh helpful um and 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 true i came to believe that heaven is real and that we are enjoying it right now. The word that you want to use is heaven. I'll use that word. I I brought it up. I know that Stacy cherished, as I'm sure you do, both of you, every minute, every second, as hard as they were, and they were hard. 
she this was where she wanted to be where she had arrived where she tried to 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 enjoy that she was surrounded by family friends loved ones the sunshine on her face the music the work that she continued to do making herself a voice for ALS so the religious background the faith that we had was in trying to understand our world and and being human as much as possible that that's that's kind of what our our educations were both about stacy and me really trying to grapple with what it is to be human in this tiny speck of time that we have and in some ways you and stacy other folks battling this disease and others who know that we all know that time is finite. Our time is finite together. What happens after that? We don't know. But we know that this amount of time is finite. And what are we going to do with it? How are we going to be of service? How are we going to be as present and as holy as possible, as creative and godlike as we can be? And and um, I, I really got in touch with a lot of that stuff. That that being creative, being as godlike as possible is kind of the best thing that we can do with our time, however much time we have. I don't know if that's a that's the answer that I have. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That makes a lot of sense. So, Jonathan, we talked a lot about the the past and Survivor and the TV shows and running into the different people you've run into in your career. What's exciting you about the future? What are you looking forward to? Well, I have a, a number of projects. Um, um, and I am seeing somebody, which is wonderful. Um, life has gone on for me. Very different kind of person than Stacy, but a wonderful person who respects that. You know, it's it's hard for it's hard for them to have Stacy in in my heart, um, and um, knows that my heart is open to the world, you know, and to new, to, to, to the future, to the present and to the future and not just to the past. I am working on, on, on a project that I don't think I can talk about, um, because it hasn't happened yet. Developing a new immersive horror, um, um, event, which is really cool. Something that's, that's never that's been done nice. before. When when it happens, um, I'll be happy to tell you about it and promote yeah. it. Um, and I'm working at the Tribeca Film Festival, uh, showing horror and genre movies in something called Escape from Tribeca. We're in our second year now, and I program movies, old movies and new movies, um, bring lectures and panels, parties, things like that, so that horror fans and genre fans in New York from around the world can come to New York City in June and see some really, really groovy stuff. It's a great, great party, um, Tribeca Festival. And it's uh, 11 days from June 5th till June 17th. I'll be there every day. And if you're interested, I don't know how we put that link, but go to Escape from okay, Tribeca sorry. or TribecaFilm.com and you'll find it. Okay. Please come, everybody. You guys for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> is there a, is there a um, you know, you're working on those kind of projects now. Do you have a, has your goals changed at all in your in your career? Do you have a, something that you want to achieve or anything like from just a professional standpoint that you want to check off the list? You've done it. You've had a pretty so winning an Oscar. Yeah. I think an Oscar <laughs> I mean, winning yeah. survivor. The two things that have um, seeing the cure for ALS. My wife had a genetic form. My kid has the gene. I don't want him to go through what Stacy went through. I don't want to go through it again myself. So I'm fighting for that. One of the reasons I'm happy, honored to be with you is to just get the word out to as many people as possible that we need more, more, more help and more awareness. Um, something that I would like to do, I, I, I preach the word of horror. I know it sounds, it's, 
It sounds obnoxious because you just asked me about religion. It's not my religion. It's it's just something that I believe in. I believe that it's very entertaining, obviously, but I also do believe that it's important and helpful. It can be, even if it's just entertaining. But 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 as a way for folks to grapple with some of the stuff that we've been talking about, it's 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 great. It's a way for people to grapple with things that they should grapple with and, and they may take for granted. Um, let me ask you and your beautiful family how you're doing, and what's happening. You do this beautiful podcast. Tim, you look fantastic. Your color is so good to see your smiling face and to hear you asking me questions and talking with me. I want to hear from you. I know it's hard, but I have all the time in the world. I want to hear from you. If you can tell me how you're doing, what, 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 what where you're at. I'm used to waiting. You know what? This is, I mean, edited or not, I think, I think that the audience can get to see, maybe you do, I, you know, I don't know how much of this gets edited or what you do with it. It's worth letting people see that communicating with the beautiful person with, with ALS takes time. It teaches all of us a tremendous amount of patience, of empathy, of, of love and care. And you just sit with the person and let them communicate a, with you. Jonathan, I think it's a, a really good point. And one of the things that we've talked about constantly about this podcast and just in general is, um, you know, it's like you want my, my dad, Stacy, everybody with ALS, like their ability to communicate slows down by just say 99%. But they have all the same thoughts. They have the same brain. They have the same. It's all still there. Yes. And one of the things that's so tough that they don't tell you about, like when you look up ALS, uh, like we did, you know, it's, it's a scary thing when you read about it online and you don't know what it is. And you hear about all the stuff physically and, and the trach and an event and uh, right, all this stuff. But one thing that nobody ever really told us about is, you know, the the, the social side of it. Because my dad will have... He, his ability to outreach to friends and family and people he wants to speak with, it's so much lower because it has to be. And mm-hmm. people don't reach out to him as much out of good intention. They think, I know it's hard for Tim to communicate, so let me pull back a little bit. So you end up almost like isolated in a way too, which is part of this. Part of the beauty in this podcast is there's all these people that my, you know, we get to connect with and talk to, and it's long form. What I love about podcasts is the, the long form content, so we can we can take the time to to talk and have deeper conversations. Mm. The the only reason we edit out the kind of downtime in between is just to make it more palatable for the people who don't understand, right? The people who don't know what it's like. And I think it's, but to your point, I think. Would the world be a better place if we all slowed down a little bit and listened? I, I, I think so. I mean, it's easy for me to say it's your beautiful podcast and you'll do what you want. Folks, If we even if we keep the screen as it stands now, Tim has been having to let us talk, forget what we're talking about, so that he could answer the question from five minutes ago. It must be very, very frustrating. And we keep talking and he's going to do his thing. And, it, you know, the dynamic becomes very, very new and unusual. And you want to. I mean, I was always trying to be conscious. I'm sure I succeeded to some degree and failed to some degree into keeping Stacy part of the conversation. You know, and 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 yeah, and really dealing with her in the present, and to do that meant beautifully slowing down and just saying, "Yeah, take your time. I'm here. We're not going anywhere." You know, we have. Yeah. Th- there's nothing more important than this present moment being together. So, so I'm. I look forward to whatever you're cooking up right now, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> face my god both of you you know just to see the 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 beauty of the of of a person a beauty of a person my god yeah what a gift in some ways the biggest curses are also the biggest blessings you know they're the same thing and and nothing in my life certainly in stacy's life was as impactful, as impactful, as rich, 
both terribly and wonderfully as this experience was. Yeah, we, we've talked about on our side how we, we have always had a close family, but, you know, we nothing brought us closer together. You right? thought but you were close. Know. You thought yeah. you were close, you know? Yeah. And you That's were. Right. I mean, I'm, again, you know, you don't want to say like, oh, you, 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 this poor family never went through ALS. They don't know what it is to be close or intimate. You know, it's better. Sometimes a little ignorance. My friend said yeah. to me, I said, I don't, I don't need, I don't need this much character. You know? <laughs> He says it's character building. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't need any more character. I got plenty of character. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I saw on uh, Twitter, I guess now X, I have to say, your your is your son going into neurology or ALS? Yes, specifically? my yes, my son's going into it. He's there now. He's a extraordinarily brilliant, wonderful person. Is an MD PhD student at Penn Medical School. Um, and is planning to be a neurologist specializing in the genetic forms of ALS. He has the C9 gene mutation, and which is what uh, killed his mother and his grandmother and his grand great grandfather. Threatens him, so he's going to fight the good fight. See if he can't be a part of the team. That uh, that's amazing. Yeah, amazing, I love amazing. That. That's Taking taking matters into your own hands, kind of, right? You know, he has an extraordinary perspective that gives him great um sure power is the word, but you know, he's like, Oh, I don't think that's gonna work. Nope, I don't think that's gonna work. I don't want to work on that. Yeah. He's able to he's really gotta cut through, he's gotta cut through all the noise, right? He's gotta he doesn't it's it's a it's a really cool it's it's I wish he didn't have it, but it's a really cool perspective to have because there's no, he doesn't have time for any of the nonsense, right? He's got to get right. to it. That's right. That's really cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. I knew he was, I saw on your, on your Twitter slash X account that I saw you uh, retweet something saying that he was into it, but I didn't know, I didn't know that full connection. I didn't know that he also had that, that gene. Yes. Unfortunately, Tim has been working this whole time, working his butt off. You know, to 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 give me an honest and wonderful answer, I'm sure. And it's important for people to really get. A, I, for me, it, it was important. It was very meaningful to come to understand how much we take for granted, and how and how important communication and patience is. You know, that we take for granted the ability to just sort of up, 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 like this. And you know, it's not a given. It's not. We were Jonathan. I was I was getting recruited to go play. Division one football. I thought I'm 17 years old. I thought I could have walked on water if they would have let me try. Right. And uh, I show up at uh, the college of UCF down in Orlando and it's like this big school, it's big time football. I walked in again, um, um, testosterone's out my ears. And the, the receptionist is like sitting there. She's a really old woman. She ended up being a really sweet old lady, but she's typing on her keyboard and doesn't even look up at me. I'm like, I'm like, Hey, uh, I'm Troy green. I'm here to see the coach. And she looks up at me and she, she goes like this. She takes her glasses off. She goes, you're not as handsome as your daddy. Puts her glasses back on and starts talking. <laughs> I said, yes, I said, don't I cut said, that out. I said, I get that a lot. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. That I love so that fun. story. That She's probably great. our age. Tim, she was probably yeah. our age at that time. Right? I was this really old lady. You know, she was 52 <laughs> years old. Yeah. <laughs> when you're 17, 52 is like Methuselah. Yeah. <laughs> how how old's your dad? How old are you? Now? Well, I know you're answering. He just, he just turned 60 in December. Yeah. So I like so, to give him happy birthday. Time. He's officially old. <laughs> <laughs> every, right. year, every year, Jonathan, I tell him uh, out of one side of my mouth, I tell him 60 is the new 40, and on the other side of my mouth, I say you're getting old. And they're both true. You're getting old too, kid. I know. I I have three kids. I have to lock the door. I have three kids that could run in at any second. Uh, I'd love to see them. I'm sure your dad would too. Sorry for the delay. Here's the answer to your question. I am strong. And my strength, as I said, comes from my Christian faith. I look at my disease as a second chance to focus 
on what is most important in this life. To love your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, which are the words of Jesus Christ. He says many more brilliantly kind things that I try to follow. And I believe that the greatest gift from God, besides his mercy and his son, is family. And I treasure my family more than ever before. We have a saying among us, I love you forever and infinity. And lately, that's taken on a new meaning. So that's a gift. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you for your um, your heart and your mind and your incredible spirit. I thank you. I send love to you and your family. That was. Jonathan Pennert, you have a beautiful soul. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you. You have a beautiful soul. You have a beautiful family. Lucky. Lucky. Luck runs both ways, but you are a lucky, lucky man. You are alive. More alive, maybe, than anyone has ever been. As alive as anyone has ever been, certainly. Jonathan, thanks so much for, for the time today and, and uh, joining us here for the stories, the, the highs and the lows. We had some, I think we had some tears, and we had some laughs. We had everything in between, which is beautiful. Um, if people want to connect with you or hear from you, where should they go? Where can they, where can they find more out about you? Um, uh, on X, Twitter is mostly where I'm found findable. Uh, Survivor Penner is, is my handle. I'd be happy to, you know, be in touch with anyone. I, I so appreciate it. And, and this opportunity to meet you really uh, in a more profound, deeper way. You know, we've been in touch a little bit, but it really has been a pleasure. And um, if we can spread the word on kindness, uh, whatever your religion, and I so respect your your um, uh, insights and your output, um, that's all we can do. What a beautiful, beautiful afternoon I've had. Thank you so much. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, nothing left unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern US, Washington DC, and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. I wanna thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you wanna make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.